Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legendino, aka the Wikipedia, if you're a Yank, Tim Vickery, who is in Rio. And he, with his bucket and spade and his saucy holiday postcard, <laughs> is the king of nighttime radio, who's currently doing other things during nighttime. Don't know well, about you. How indeed. Are you, I'm very well, thanks very much. And we do like to be beside the seaside. Um, and the seaside for me is the River Lee. You might know it. <laughs> <laughs> no bucket and spades there, mate. You need a flipping pickaxe and shovel <laughs> to get any sand. <laughs> Anyway, great to see you back. So uh, another pair of shades. You're going red today, yeah? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of red. It, it, it combines nicely with the with the green shirt. No, it and, doesn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't combine well at all with the green shirt, uh, and it's very bright here. It's yeah, my kind of winter. It's bright here as well, but we just can't afford the number of sunglasses that you got, mate. Mm -hmm. Flip figure. How many more do we have to endure? I'm going to have to go uh, to the yeah, shop to get a couple. I think I've used them all now. I've got a few recently. I've got, I've got three pairs recently. Yeah, um, well, you so, can always recycle yeah. them. You always recycle. So they do good business in sunshade <laughs> over in Brazil today, when you're about, anyway. Indeed. <laughs> Listen. Well, uh, what, what, it, what it is, is uh, as you get older... No, I'm, I'm getting a bit worried about my eyes. You know what I mean? I've got Barry Norman eyes, you know, the bags under them and so on. And, you know, and from obviously hideous overwork and 40 years of wearing contact lenses. So uh, I think I, I kind of look younger somehow. If, uh, if I oh, so eyes. you wear contacts? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I've been wearing contacts since the summer of 1981. So next year will be 40 years. Flipping out, you kept that quiet. Yeah, well, that's the point of contact lenses, isn't it? Really? <laughs> 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 yes that is the point that is true i can't argue with that mate i can't argue that i forgot i who've got 2020 vision yeah like hell but for the meantime have been able to avoid wearing glasses i remember an optician telling me about five years ago when i went to opticians you know it's probably more than five years probably about eight years ago now i went to the optician sort of like saying look my eyes mate my eyes and he's like look can you just stretch it out a little bit because you know once you go for the glasses then that's it that's the point yeah. of no return yeah I've stretched it and stretched it and here i am still <laughs> i'm still <laughs> able to see probably better than i could eight years ago so it just goes to show the eyes are powerful mate um always sort of like um, try and put off wearing contact lenses for as long as you can unless you know you're as blind as about as you seem to be now i am i am and you're right the day after you are utterly dependent on them. The day after, it just doesn't, nothing works oh, wow. without them, you know? So, uh, yeah, it, oh, it, wow. they, it, it does, the, the element of dependence on them does, does worry me. And I, I often think, let's imagine I'm in a plane and it, it's uh -huh. in an emergency because on a long flight, I'll, I'll usually take them out. Mm -hmm. You know, and they say, you can't go back for anything. You've got to abandon the plane. <laughs> uh, I often think about this. You would so go like, back for your contact lenses. I would. I Come would, yeah. off it, mate. <laughs> I remember when Nobby Styles was the first footballer in the top flight to wear contact lenses. At that time, they were 200 quid a pair. 200 quid would probably be like 10 grand now to most of us. And at that time, you know, whoever was commentating uh, for the match of the day or whatever said, so what happens if one of them pops out and it falls on the pitch? And said, well, you're going to have to call a halt to the match. <laughs> and everybody's got to... Get down on their knees and look for it at that price. Those are the days when, you know, money was money, mate. You know, it's I, like I still remember the gorgeous kind of orb and almost Diana Rigg, who just left us, style mm. hair, that kind of hair, having a that's slow not dance. Styles. Not, that's with, not uh, Nobby Styles. No, that's not Nobby Styles. No, that's not Nobby Styles. I can't remember her name. But uh, in that slow dance, um, I lost the lens. At the uh, it was a uh, youth club disco. No, it was a bit older than youth club disco. It was some Look kind of disco mate. thing. When I was, yeah. oh, <laughs> so, why didn't you invite me to any of these discos, <laughs> man? You went on your own. <laughs> 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 Flipping out. See, typical blokes, you know, they don't want to invite their friends because then they'll have competition. Indeed. But that, indeed. That's Dinah Rigg uh, look like. Actually, it hurt me, Dinah Rigg, a little bit mm. because, you know, that she belongs to an area of us. I feel sorry for her because she was such a great actress and she did many other roles, but she'll yep. always be remembered for one, which is The Avengers. But it was great. It was fantastic, The Avengers. I mean, I love the fact, I love that there's a real partnership between Steed, Patrick McNee, and her a real chemistry. partnership 
chemistry. And, and yeah, there's chemistry, but it's also partnership. And um, there, there was once where uh, the director was saying to, to Patrick Minley, um, can you order, order Mrs. Peel Dinerig to do something? And, he's, and, and uh, he said, no, she's not my assistant. She's my partner. And I thought, I think that that, that was great. And it, it kind of set a tone. And you, you wonder with someone like Dinah Rigg, how many lives did she influence? Young oh, girls God. seeing that thinking, I could do that. Because you've got, you got to see it to be it. Mm. She did the karate kicks way before Bruce Lee. Although on reflection, <laughs> she basically raised her legs, mate. I mean, I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> yeah. but it, wasn't the, it wasn't the roundhouse kick that we know from Bruce Lee whatsoever. And uh, I, I think the, the, and it was always male um, baddies that she was up against. They, they gave in a little bit too easily to her um, knee are you, high. Are you doubting the, real, the realism of this show? <laughs> Yeah, knee-high leather boots or patent leather boots as the style was at that time. But she was a fashion icon as well. And yep. let's not forget what her name was in The Avengers. Do you remember? Yeah, Emma Peel. Man yeah. Appeal. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. So, and, and also, she's getting less money than the cameraman. So really? she's working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she, she found that out. Um, so oh. she's working in a totally sexist context but the message that she is able to send transcends that and i think that's uh, that, that, that 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 that's something that, that will live forever what a legacy and then 50 years later she shows up in uh, game of thrones i don't know if yeah, you've which, seen it which no i've never seen it and nor had oh, she no really she never no, saw it no. She, never saw it. <laughs> no. she was brilliant in it though she was yeah. absolutely i mean first of all it's kind of like is that Dinah Rigg? Is that who yeah. I think it is? Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, you haven't seen her for a while unless you've mm. been in the theatre and all that. And then you think, it's got to be Dinah Rigg because she's stealing the flipping scene. Every scene she's in, she's like stealing, she's nicking the flipping scene off the lead stars and everything. And you thought, nah, that's her, mate. That's Dinah Rigg. That's Dinah Rigg all over. And um, when she, I'm going to give something away for you now. I'm going to reveal something. When she meets her doom in Game of Thrones, it is actually, should I even bother watching this anymore? Because they right. ripped the heart out of your desire uh -huh. for the program. And she, she was amazing in that. I'll, I'll say that. And yeah, you're right. What a legacy. And, uh, died with her boots on. By, well, not those knee high ones, but nevertheless, uh, died with her boots on by all accounts. This link that we started off with today between the past and the present, I think that's very, very appropriate for our topic today. The game that we're going we're gonna to riff around. It's, uh, it's an FA Cup final that went to a replay. It's Manchester United against Brighton from 1983. And if you look at this, and we can both remember the time, um, it's totally, totally different from today's world. <laughs> but it's at a moment where today's world is beginning to be forged. Mm. I, I like the way you did that. For those who don't know, um, on this Brazilian shirt name podcast, every week we look at a particular iconic match from somewhere in football history that tends to be dominated by the English uh, leagues, I won't lie, but we do foreign to the South American, the European leagues and anywhere else there might be iconic football matches. We'll get to Africa, we'll get to Asia, we'll get to all the other parts of the world as well, North America included. Don't worry, guys. <clears throat> but today, as you say, Tim, it's the 21st of May, 1983. FA Cup final uh, between Manchester United, who need no introduction whatsoever. They are the Goliaths in this final against the Minnows, of Brighton. Nobody gives Brighton a hope of putting one over on Manchester United. Nobody gives them a hope whatsoever. You've already given the game away that goes into a replay, but that's all good because uh, we can look at the day's newspapers at the time to see what they were writing about this match. Yeah. And uh, no, the, re the replay was on the, the, the 26th. So the, the, the 21st of May the game and then the replay is the 26th and in between i was i, I turned 18 what a moment in the young oh wow life. oh wow yeah. okay the day before the 25th 
I then, turned I, I turned eighteen. Then I must have just turned in sixteen or something about that. <laughs> something time. like that, yes. Yeah, something like that. I can't do my maths. You know I can't do my maths. So don't ask me to do them. But um the the the, the match is pay, played as the other half of Britain, the maybe non footballing half of Britain, is considering the coming elections. So mm. in three elections, important elections. Um, that will see the Tories win power once again. I've just come back from Sweden. In fact, I'm halfway between Sweden and England at this point. I didn't even realise, whilst this game is going on, guess who's visiting Sweden? No No, idea? No No, idea. I had no idea either. Do you know, Her Majesty the Queen has gone on the Royal Yacht Britannia, which will glide through the allegedly Soviet submarine-infested waters (laughs) of the Stockholm Archipelago, carrying not just the Queen, but Prince Philip on their first state visit to Sweden for 27 years. Now, shall I tell you about this Russian submarine? Do you want to know? Do you remember it? (laughs) No, I don't. I don't. Okay, Stockholm is part of an archipelago of islands. If you go, what we call, well, I say we, the Swedes call Hr Gordon, which kind of means pink garden, maybe. And uh, all these little tiny islands are brilliant. You know, you can own an island in Sweden. And if you've got a boat, loads of Swedes have got boats, their own boats. They've got their country houses as well, you know, little... <clears throat> little you know cabins in the countryside with a lot of land around it because there's only eight million of them in a country that's two and a half times the size of britain so they've got a lot of land to play with and if you've got a boat you can travel through where gordon um and every now and then remember i was still traveling on my nigerian passport at this point every now and then you see a sign saying no foreigners allowed on this island Wow. Yeah, because it's militarily sensitive. Because the only way is that Sweden can fight a somewhat conventional war is unconventionally through sort of guerrilla guerrilla tactics. So they've got all these sort of ammunition dumps all over the country. When I first went to Sweden, you know, people were robbing post offices with machine guns. I was like, wow, that is, that's hardcore, <laughs> mate. They don't need the money that bad, do they? But machine guns are very easy to get hold of because... Um, all these ammunition dumps in the woods. And if you had done your military service, which you had to do at the time in Sweden, and that's another story that I'll come on to another time. Uh, if you'd done your military service and you were a quartermaster or whatever it is, you know, the boat that looks after all the kit, you will know where some of these dumps are. So these dumps are com- completely get, consistently getting broken into and loads of uh, machine guns stolen from them. <clears throat> and anyway, I'd seen all these signs. I mean, they do shit you up. You say, you know, <laughs> Utlenninger, you know, forbid, which means you know, no foreigners, you're forbidden. And you think, shit, okay, let me move on. But the Russian submarine, or should I say the Kremlin, didn't take a blind bit of notice out of this. So one day, guess who comes aground in Claire Gordon? Obviously, you're in an archipelago. You're not quite in the Baltic Sea, so the archipelago won't be as deep as the Baltic Sea. So this Russian submarine's come over from Russia, come across the Baltic Sea, and guess what? It's gone aground in the relatively shallow waters around the Swedish archipelago, and it's got nowhere to go. And it's like a sore thumb sticking out. So it takes the cops a couple of hours to get all these reports, you know, to believe all the reports of people saying, uh, I think there's a submarine stuck in Claire Gordon, and it's got a Russian flag or insignia on it. It takes them a few a couple of hours to realise this, and they rush over. And of course, the Russian captain, he knows he's going to be sent off to Siberia, and he's just like, just do what you can to get me the fuck out of here as quickly as possible before the news reaches home. But it takes a few days, maybe a couple of weeks or whatever it is, and eventually after diplomatic and that, and a tugboat and that, they get out. So the Queen's going to Sweden at this time. Do you see why my mind wasn't focused on that FA Cup final as it would normally have been? And Brighton end up, ended up going down like the submarine, but they were so close to glory. Uh, and uh, the, what, the FA Cup final back in those days was much bigger and much more important than it is now. Brighton were relegated that season. But had they won the FA Cup 
that's that's a successful season. That's a great season. That that's that's even but you know you would rather win the FA Cup and get relegated than stay in the in the in, in the top flight and and lose the FA Cup. That's how important the cup was. I'm not sure and, about that, mate, because that was the was problem huge. with Wigan. Wigan. Do you remember when we won the? Yeah, FA but that, that, that that's much down. later. Yeah. That's when the Premier League. That's when the big money is in is, is in the is in, sure. is in the Premier League. But they've struggled but at this to time, get anywhere near the top again. Really yeah. struggled. They've gone down and down. But remember, Brighton would have had European football next season because they would have been in the Cup Winners Cup. So that would have brought them some revenue, and they'd probably been able to come back. And the relegation would have been a minor hiccup. But they would have had the, the glory. Yeah, I think so. I think back in because the whole country stopped for the FA Cup final. You know, with a build up at starting at seven in the morning and something. Mm. And, and there was there was a huge. Although it's Brighton on the south coast, there was a huge Liverpool feel to it because the manager was an old Liverpool player, uh, Jimmy Melia, who, who was one of those. Was it? Was it both well, managers? Yeah, the other one is Ron Atkinson, who's uh, I don't know, I don't know where he's from. No, he's from I, I think he, no, no, I think he's got Liverpool. I, I remember the commentary in the build-up as you talk of saying that both managers have got Liverpool connections, but I could be wrong there. Uh, it so doesn't sound Jimmy, like he's a scouser. Jimmy Neal is one of those scousers who could have been a stand-up comedian. You know, mm. there, there, you know, there, there was that certain generation where all of them could either be musical stars or they could be stand-up comedians. And Jimmy Melia could certainly be a stand-up, have been a stand-up comedian. So he was very charismatic and he played it all up for the cameras. And there was, uh, running their midfield was someone who just joined them from Liverpool, Jimmy Case. So there was a real Liverpool versus United feel. Uh, it might have been the Jimmy Case thing that I was thinking about. Yeah, sorry, it, rather than Ron Atkinson, apologies. So th there was a real kind of Liverpool against United feel around it anyway. Uh, and uh, Brighton were so, so, so close to winning, so unbelievably close. It was it was a dramatic game. It was one of those FA Cup finals that is full of ebbs and flows. And uh, and Brighton managed to equal, equalise. Look, it looks like United have got it in the bag. They go two one up. Ray Wilkins, who was a fabulous he player, was brilliant. one of those players, he was unbelievably brilliant. underrated. Yeah, Ray he was Wilkins. brilliant in this match, mate. One touch pass to the flipping foot of the you know player that you wanted to pass to. Ray Wilkins these days, you, they, they wouldn't, he, he would have been priceless because mm. he, he had this habit of passing the ball to a player who was wearing the same coloured shirt, mm. which you know, these days is much more highly valued in English football than it, than it was back then. And people were impatient with him because he didn't, didn't blast it forward. But he was, mm. he, was, he was great, Ray Wilkins, and he looked to have won it with a terrific goal. And then United, maybe it's that thing of being so close to victory, they went to pieces. And in the last few minutes, Brighton not only get an equaliser, but all, with the last kick of the game, Michael Robinson, who went off, what a reinvention there, Michael Robinson. He went off to Spain and ended up having a new career as a, a, on, on Spanish media as a, as a massively respected and much loved football journalist in Spanish. He would always talk about Spain as we. <laughs> he sets up a, a chance for Gordon Smith. Gordon Smith is one-on-one -on -one with the United goalkeeper, Gary Bailey. It's the last kick of the game. And he doesn't shoot well, and Bailey manages man, man, manages to save it. So Brighton were so so close to winning, and now they've got to wait for a replay. But there's there's good news for the replay, because their talismanic captain, centre back, wild man with a headband, who went to the World Cup with England the year before, Steve Foster, he's suspended for the first game but he's able to play in the replay. So they can have Steve Foster back. Mm -hmm. So that's going to tighten up their defence even more, isn't it? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. no, 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 oh, it didn't. It didn't. Oh, obviously it didn't. No, no. <laughs> okay, you see, you've jumped the gun and you've gone on to the next match. But you did mention that FA Cup, you know, the, the, um, the romance of the FA Cup, as they describe it, starts very early on the Saturday morning of the Cup for those of us youngsters, certainly, in Britain. Youngsters and those uh, supporting either team. It starts off early, you get your bunting out, particularly if it's your local team, and you hang it from your house to your neighbour's house across the street so that everybody in the neighbourhood knows, ah, we're in an FA Cup final. So for, for my neighbourhood of Tottenham, there was none of this because it was Man United versus Brighton, but I could imagine what it was like at Old Trafford and not the city end of Manchester. Well, they're the only real team in Manchester after all. So let's talk about Salford in the Old Trafford end of Salford, as the city lot would like to say. I imagine that the bunting was hanging. And this was before what has happened now, which is the development of that entire area. Mm -hmm. This is probably in the days of the old Manchester ship canal and ships mm -hmm. were coming in from 
Brazil and Canary Islands and everywhere or, else. Or possibly the ships were stopping coming in. Ah. Well, maybe because it, it was a hard time, you know, 83. It, it was well, really, industrially, really hard time. economically, yeah. Let's All not over the place. And not, I mean, yeah. This is exactly the moment when I left school. Uh, I did me did me A levels right after after this um, this this game, and then I left school. And uh, I was living in, in Hemel Hempstead, which is light industry, new town, rel- relatively prosperous, just north of London. Yeah, it was London overspill. Really, that, that was that was the point of it. Uh, no jobs. There was absolutely no prospect mm. of any. And I had all the O levels, all the A levels, and so on. I was lined up to get a job on a local paper, and that went bust. Everything was going bust. So I was trying to. Uh, I spent all that that long hot summer um, trying to get a job, and I couldn't even get interviews for anything. But anything at the end of Sept- at the end of the summer, kind of the start of September, I got a job. Finally got a job, which was uh, in a menswear shop, fifty quid a week. Uh, and uh, fifty and there, quid a week, even then, yeah. that was tight, mate. That was rough. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, yeah. Even then, that, yeah, yeah. That, that was that was shop work for you. Um, uh, and uh, I've. In, in my second week there, the company went into liquidation. Um, so uh, I ended up working there because it was like a closing down sale. Yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was a chain and lots of the branches kept on closing and we were getting the stock. So I, I got about eight, eight or nine months out of it until the thing finally, finally ended and finally went under. Mm. But, you know, th- 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 this was Hemel. And you, mm. you, couldn't, you couldn't even dream of, 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 of jobs. Um, and it, it's, luckily for me, I had all the bits of paper and I could go to college and they paid you to go to, go to college. Oh, yeah, I never even, yeah, never even days. imagined going to university. But I yeah. thought, I've got to get out of this job market for, 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 for three years. Mm. Uh, you know, for people who didn't have that, that uh, backup, blimey. And people living in areas that were worse affected than, than, than my area was, mm. absolutely nothing. It was, it was a, it, it really tough times, 1983. You did well to get out of it and go to Sweden, I think. Well, I was out of it before that. The moment Mrs. Thatcher got in power, I was like, oh, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. Yeah. Let me go and decamp somewhere else. And lucky enough, I was able to yeah, get the opportunity education-wise, just like you. It was education that got us lot out of you know, the was. conditions we were in, to be honest, and gave us a chance in life. And um, But back to the match. Back to the match. And you've raised a couple of really interesting points. You know, the preamble to the match we which we've both seen uh, john Motson commentating uh, for you know hours it would have been in those days uh, preamble wise and then the match itself and so on uh, starts off by saying that uh, th- these teams they, they're gonna have a bonus if they win the match they're gonna have a financial bonus on this average you know, how much he said it was <laughs> <laughs> a few thousand pounds, you know, which would have been like Ooh. amazing to a lot for the Brighton lot. Certainly, would have been amazing. And then the camera pans on, you know, which is a good old British tradition. I know other countries have done it, but good old British tradition, which is the homemade banner, the homemade banner. You know, nowadays, if you saw a homemade banner on a pitch, you just say, "Oh, clear off." So you buy yourself a proper banner. Everybody can afford it now. But in those days, we made them at home. It was DIY banners. And the one, they couldn't believe, you know, the commentators, the cameraman's panning along and uh, there's one that says, yeah, white side, normal white side, of course, Manchester United's 18-year-old midfield genius, as he was, um, well, as he would be, certainly. And it says, white side's going to be on his backside, you know, after this match. <laughs> I thought that was very good. And the referee at the time, uh, a bloke called Alf Gray, um, he says in the paper of the day that he'll have no hesitation in sending off a player for the first time in FA Cup final history if a professional foul is committed against a man with a clear goal chance. I just hope the situation does not arise, the Bird's Eye Foods manager from Great Yarmouth said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Readers will remember that Liverpool's goalkeeper, Grobola, uh, was only cautioned for what many thought a dismissal offence in this season's Milk Cup final. So 1983, we still haven't had a single player yeah. in the 60-year history, 60 years of history at this point of the FA Cup. Not one player has ever been sent off, which suggests to me that the FA Cup had not just the gravitas, but had the 
reverence and the respect that was nobody would want to be the first player to be sent yeah, off. Yeah, but also it was really hard to get sent off. You really had days, to yeah. try and get yeah. sent off. And I remember 80, 1980, Willie Young of Arsenal. Little Paul Allen of West Ham would squeak, squeaky little voice. He squeaked his way past Willie Young. Uh, and he's one on, right there, mate. Squeaky yeah, it was, little voice. Just, just like that. He's one on one with a goalkeeper, and Willie Young just hauls him down. And these days, there's no, there's no argument. It's a red card. Yeah. Back then, the commentator, yeah, had to do it. Had to do it. <laughs> had to do it. It was a man's game back then, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was like rugby, wasn't it? <laughs> Do you know how much referee Alf Gray was getting paid for this? What, um, to be a referee or to be yeah, a bird's eye the... food <laughs> manager? <laughs> well, if I was on, if, if I was on 50 quid a week, yeah. he's, got, he's, he's got to work for 90 minutes. Yeah, uh, He's yeah. still going to get more than me, I fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, funny enough, he didn't. Oh, wow, <laughs> you're joking. <laughs> He got a 40 quid, 40 yes. quid. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know you're happy. <laughs> He'll pick up 40 quid for his labour today, which he reckons will just about pay him back for all the two bob bits and 10 pence pieces he has used for tossing up and then giving to club <laughs> mascots <laughs> over the years. Today, he will use a 1960 half crown from his collection of coins from 1935 onwards the date of his birth the coin has particular relevance for 1980 was the year he first started refereeing in local norfolk leeds in three years he made it to the top flight of refereeing wow. it's top. Yeah, that ain't bad is it Fast track. Bad. so and he is um significant in this game in that he allows it to flow I can't, I mean, you've mentioned some of those tackles. I can't imagine a referee today wouldn't have been blowing their whistle every 30 seconds of this match, you know, or every 45 seconds, whatever it would be. It's a different game, isn't it? On yeah. ploughed, pit, ploughed fields for pitches uh, and uh, a lot of agricultural tackling going on. It's, it's, it's a different game. Yeah, apparently the man in black, as he always was then, ha had also been a, a bass singer in their choir, of uh, in Galston on Sea, where he lives, for the last fifteen years, and his first love, what was that? Sporting wise, his first love. Where was he from again? Uh, <laughs> where he lived in um, Gaul Galston on Sea, surfing. No, it was you don't like cricket. Oh. I know <laughs> you love it. But as he's a singer, should we take a look at the charts of the day? This is what we I think. Do. I think we should. I think we should because. I think it's a, re it's, it's, a, it's a very relevant chart. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about 80, 83 is the moment of the Thatcher triumph. Mm. Despite the fact that things are hard, things are really hard. But that Falklands war a year earlier, had, it bought her time, didn't it? And it, 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 it bought her it, votes it, as well. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just it moved the political landscape and it enabled her to plow full speed ahead with, with, her, with her project. And although times are really hard, you can look at this chart and you can see that in comparison, say, with the charts of two years earlier, there's a much more frivolous generation emerging. Now, the, the chart frivolous? of, say... Yeah, well, so the, well, the chart in comparison two, to the punk of a few years yeah. earlier. Well, well, not, not only punk, but... Two, two years earlier, with a lot of riots going on, mm. the theme tune to that summer was Ghost Town by the Specials. Yep, yep, yep. And yep. if you look at this chart, I mean, there's one record that it's just coming as a new entry at 12, Money Go Round by the Style Council, which mm. got me through my A-levels in just a blaze of, fl of fury. But a lot of them, there's a kind of new frivolous feel to, 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 uh, to what's going on. I, I do agree with you in terms of lyrics, you know, you had all these flipping new romantic... I'm not necessarily saying that as a criticism. No, I'm, I'm just... no, no. But no, I, I do... I do it, I'm not criticising them either. Funny enough, I think this period delivered some of the most memorable melodies um, mm -hmm. of certainly my lifetime, actually, because some of the melodies are great. But I wonder whether the music... First of all, it's permeated by that flipping drum machine sound yeah. of the 80s, which destroyed that, a really lot of coming big time. Oh, isn't it? my word. It the destroyed first, the first, that era. The first time I really remember it 
well, I thought it was revolutionary, was remember the whispers and the beat goes on? A yes, few years, yes. Uh, two yes. or three years earlier. Yes. And you're, you're hearing something new. You're hearing something less organic. It, f uh, funny enough, the first time I heard it was slightly before that, I think it was, um, the first time it really registered anyway was Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Do you remember oh, right, Herbie yeah, Hancock yes, came out of yes, that instrument? It yes. was amazing in the hip hop days. It was absolutely amazing. That's the first time I really sort of like was cognizant of the beatbox was I think before that it had been used as a kind of a uh, a the, you try to get the drum the authentic drum sound out of it I yeah. remember you know we had a kind of a beatboxing going on in a band that I played in but we tried to get as close to the authentic whereas in the 80s they said no 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 let's just have this tinny sound that it's very clear that it's a beatbox rather than try and imitate the drummer the drummer can do his thing you can have a beatbox on top of the drummer kind of thing sometimes and i think what well, they lost sight because synth was taken over at this point the synth was a uh, i mean arguably synth had taken over from gary newman's days and uh, the afterward days or at least it'd been there all the time but the synthesizer you know they still called it the moog do you remember that they called it the yeah. moog synthesizer yeah. it had a kind of a name whereas now it'd become an instrument in its own right r rather than a device to add a little bit of texture as stevie wonder would have done in superstition now it'd become an instrument in its own right rather than just being um, you know the, the the equivalent of a wah-wah pedal or something like that and so i you could make money music cheaply and it was spreading, yes. you know, to, to like Basildon, i.e. Depeche Mode. Yes. Or yes, Yazoo, who were in yep. the, 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 the charts. Or Spandau here. Ballet, who or were number Spandau one Ballet. in the yeah. charts at this point. Again, I say it's an amazing melody. Certainly the ooh, 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 ooh of true. And I'm sorry, I can't do it as well as they've done it. They've done it very artistically, and I get that bit. And for me, that's the song, just the ooh, 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 and whatever they sing to it, I can't remember. Um, you know, the sound of my soul is what they're singing, I, I seem to remember. Anyway, uh, apart from the ooh, 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 there's not much in it. When you start getting into the lyrics, you're just thinking, ah, oh, just piss off, will you? You're trying to be poetic. You're new romantics. You think you're Lord Byron. You know, I'm sorry. I knew Lord Byron. And you, <laughs> sir, are not he. And uh, I'm not that old, but I'm certainly familiar with his uh, Don Juan. You know, uh, what men call love and the gods' adultery is far more common where the climate's sultry. Now, that's a better lyric than so true, funny how it seems, always in time, but never in line for dreams. What does that mean? I don't what does know. that mean? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's been listening to Marvin all night long, but he ain't as good. Oh, yeah, trust me, you know, and Marvin's got a lot to answer for, but, you know, mercy, mercy me, not this, not this. You shouldn't put it on Marvin. <laughs> and then at number two, it's Temptation, you know, which is not a bad song, parts of it, but you just wish they just stuck to the hook, which is the best bit, you know. Oh, I'd, I had a crush on her. Oh, it was, yes. Uh, it was Carol What's Kenyon. It? Oh, is that I, a I had I had a crush on her. Uh, I, thought, I thought she was all. fantastic. Feel all and, Uncle Dotton's listening. And <laughs> well, she tried to launch a, a solo career afterward on the back of it because she's she makes that song. Oh yeah, totally. Um, you know, because it's it's Heaven Seventeen, so it's that, that kind of dry and ironic electric electronic, mm. and and she just whips it up and makes mm. it human. Uh, and uh, she launched a solo career, but the material was just so terrible. Exactly. I think people wanted it to, to, to succeed, but the songs were just so awful that it, it never got off the ground. You I think she went back to being a backing singer. She should have just stayed with Heaven 17. I, I don't know if they had more songs. Or if, that was if, all if that I desired. From the, <laughs> of course it was. Um, look, the, the problem, and there are two bands here, Heaven 17 and then Fun Boy 3 later on in the charts and we'll come to fun boy three in just a moment fun boy three are uh, number seven with our lips are sealed heaven 17 number two in the charts the official uk charts of the 21st of may 1983 the day of this world cup heaven both fun boy three and heaven 17 suffer from from uh breaking up the formula you know because you're right Temptation, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm not making a sort of a racial point about this at all, but this is like white boys on, you know, I, I wouldn't say speed or ecstasy, I wouldn't say drugs, but, you know, in terms of like just the, um, 
the, the pace of which they're doing what should have been a much more subtle song. You know, there's this temptation where she's like, higher and higher, temptation, because they can't quite feel the soul bit of it. And they probably tried to do temptation. Possibly like the not. Yeah. Have done. What, one but, of the greatest lines about music I've ever heard is from Keith Richard, who, uh, you know, the, the guitarist of the Stones, and he was talking about, you know, main. I think he was talking about all those big head rock bands in the United oh, yeah. States. You know, yeah. all of them. And, yeah. uh, all the Rushes all, and all of that. Bon yeah, yeah. They, they, they will all love him. Yeah, yeah. But he would probably regard them with contempt. And I think rightly so. Uh, and he, because, you, know, you know. I'm not sure about Keith, rightly, mate. I'm not sure about but, rightly. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Because what Keith Richards is and always has been is a missionary for black music. Yeah, yeah, you could argue that. You yeah. could argue so that. He, he said about all, all those groups, he said, you know what? They've got the rock, but they haven't got the role. And that, he, he, in, in just, just a sentence, he summed up the deficiencies of all of those, the, those, those, not only rock bands, but maybe the kind of plastic synth Heaven 17 things. Mm -hmm. they, they, they brought in Carol King to give them the role. Mm because they didn't have the role there. They couldn't, they couldn't roll by themselves. But could, what would you rather have, the rock or the roll? I'd rather have the roll. Really? Give me, give me the roll. A hammer or a nail? Uh, um, as long as it's in someone else's hands, I don't mind. If I really? had a hammer, if I had a hammer, I'd give it to someone else. I'd rather be a hammer than a nail. Yes, I would, if I only could, I surely would. So there we're going to have to differ. But number three, and, and the reason why I said harsh on the rock stuff was because you can't have it both ways. If we're to say that all of those rock bands of that era fed off of Keith Richards' role, and they appropriated it in their way and regurgitated it in their way, then he does have as much to blame as we would say a moment or two ago, that Marvin Gaye has something to answer for. Uh, when it comes to Candy Girl, it's all about Michael Jackson, mate. I mean, you may as well forget <laughs> this lot and just bring on the Jackson Five as they were, because this is their song. The dances of Michael Jackson, the voices of, um, of the new edition at that time, their voices are of the, the, um, of the, of Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five as they were at that moment. They weren't, they weren't sort of like, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, new it was great it had a little bit of that 80s drum bit but i would say that what what it was jackson five retread yeah. it's a jackson five retread that motown should have done it's like why did new edition who were like the black um inheritors of new kids on the block i seem to remember or, you know one of those bands from those days because i think they had exactly the same manager if i Recall, but I, I, I could be wrong there. In my memory does so mean, right? I seem to remember it was Morris Starr of Atlantic Star was you know, the manager of at least one of those groups. And um, if not both of them. And I just wonder why it wasn't a Motown song because Motown was struggling at this point, 1983. Yeah. They started struggling to become relevant, you know? And yeah. here was other people taking on what they had done before. Yeah. And right. they've got a lot to answer for, for New Edition. Not saying New Edition weren't brilliant. Those kids are talented. I'm not saying anything away from Bobby I Brown. I remember a piece in, in the music that. press with them around that time on a visit to London. You know, a journo who'd spent the day with them in London. Uh, and he was a bit shocked <laughs> because he thought, he thought, you know, listening to, uh, to uh, you know, Candy Girl, it's all sweet and something. And he spent a day with him. He said, they ain't sweet. <laughs> These people, oh, no, no, no. No. No, trust me, mate. I, I've, I've been with uh, Bobby Brown and his brother, his older brother, can't remember him. Look, mate, uh, <laughs> they wanted to get laid as much as they could. Let's just put it that way. And that candy girl is saying, oh, she's my girl. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie. Oh, who's your girl? Oh, he's my girl. Belle Biv DeVoe, Ronnie DeVoe, um, Ricky Bell and um, uh, Ricky Bell, Belle Biv. Oh, Michael Bivens, Ralph Tresvant and Bobby Brown at that time were 
like a, it was amazing. When I first saw them, the first time I heard that was on Top of the Pops and I was like, wow. And it was kind of like coming from the hip hop scene as well, even though they're taking all their moves from Michael Jackson, they're taking it from Michael Jackson from the bad, was it the bad era of Michael Jackson? Yeah, I would have thought just the beginning of the bad era of Michael Jackson, which is kind of like hip hop moves that Michael Jackson's doing then, or hip hop has appropriated a lot of Michael Jackson's move and incorporated it into their break dance, et cetera. So they're doing all the like the body popping stuff. And let's face it, the moonwalk, which was originated by, if not Michael Jackson, then- uh, It's a bit like Shalomar, isn't it? Yeah, Jeffrey yeah, Dan yeah, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Daniels. Daniels who taught Michael Jackson exactly so you do know your history of this yeah well and Charlotte Charlotte you just when you talk about Motown and I'm remem remembering losing my contact lens okay uh, which is around so, Sh Shalomar was like our Motown you know it was it was uh, for, for, my, for my generation the songs that you know the the romantic tunes that for the earlier 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 guys it was Motown songs and Shalomar was kind of that for us mm -hmm. okay Ferret it, ears it, yeah <laughs> Ferret ears. If you listen to There It Is, it does sound like he's saying ferret ears. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. When, and talk, when was the first black British musicians that you were aware of? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, probably one of the first ones that I was aware of would have been either Linda Lewis, ended up being a good mate of my missus, by the way, or... Um, Possibly, if it wasn't Linda Lewis, who would it have been then? Um, oh, Labby Siffrey. Labby Siffrey definitely would have been up there. Um, certainly stuck out to me as very British and um, probably even more British in a way than Linda Lewis. Uh, and those are probably the two that I can think of off the top of my head. But you, you know what you said that Shadamar was our Motown? Well, at number four, at number four is... Um, Dancing Tight featuring Phil Fearon. Phil Fearon, yeah, which is a kind of, I, I like his, liked his stuff at the time. It, yeah. It's, it's openly lightweight, um, mm. but really mm. pleasant. And uh, some, as you said earlier on, some good melodies. Really good melodies. Uh, he's a great singer, a nice guy. And I think you're absolutely right, 100%. It's lightweight to what he would otherwise have been doing, because this is coming out of the Brit funk or Brit funk stroke, Brit jazz um, movement that bubbled up just about, just before that. Just yeah, before the that first I remember of that was High Tension in about 78. Yeah. And I thought yeah. they were fantastic. I thought they were a great, great band, High Tension. Mm. And then there was Central Line. Um, yeah. I think I mentioned before that I have an, you know, well, let me just put it there. There's a romantic link between me and uh, obviously, Central Line. Obviously. No, no, not obviously. <laughs> not obviously. It wasn't, I didn't come out, you know, with any sort of pride out of this one. That is embarrassing. So. But there were all those things. There were like Beggar and Co. and stuff. There, and there, there was a lot around. And one, you one of the, gr yeah, yeah, links. Mm -hmm. Fant that, that intuition is, is one of the yeah. great, black English records. But I mentioned this because you talked about the Fun Boy 3 and the Fun Boy 3 were a split off from the specials. Uh, and uh, I, I love the specials. They weren't my band. My band at the time were, were more than the Jan, the, the early 80s and then the Style Council afterwards. But I think the specials were the most important thing we had. I think so. I agree with you. Uh, they, they were the sex specials of their day. In, in, yeah. terms, of, in terms of when that two-tone thing blew up uh that you had the specials the selector the beat who we're going to talk about because they're in the charts as well and you had madness um, somewhat to the fringes of it but they're all on the two-tone label and clearly the specials were a cut above the rest just like when you heard the pistols they were clearly a cut above the rest you know slightly different from the clash but i would argue they were a cut above the clash as well when uh, mm. when a pistols tune came out in 77 which was a year of punk when the pistols tune came out it just blew everything all oh, the yes away. steve jones uh, steve jones and uh, great guitar player johnny rotten singing well yeah you had the great singing johnny rotten whereas whereas the clash were like a band um i think the pistols were like four individuals in a band if that makes sense i remember just recently not that long ago uh, you've referenced uh, Keith Richards already. I'll reference Mick Jagger. Or maybe it was Keith Richards. Well, it was one of them who said, look, compared to the Beatles, was it you that told me this? I'm just I wonder where I heard this anecdote from. Compared to the Beatles, um, you know, like the Beatles had four 
members who could all sing, who could all be front men, whereas the Stones only had one. So the Beatles had an easier time in a way because everything had to be sort of channeled through Mick Jagger. And I, I think that's the way with, um, with the Pistols. There were four individuals doing four different things. You could only channel things through Johnny Rotten, whereas with the uh, Clash, you could channel th things through Joe Strummer, through Mick Jones, and to a certain extent through Paul Simonon as well. To be, to, but, to see, be fair. All of this, in my mind, is leading to a question. And we're, we're talking about all of that stuff from 77 onwards that was angry. It was funny as well at times, but it was, it was angry. How is it that 83... When times are really hard, on times in 83 were much, much harder than they were in 77. How is it that the music is so light, lightweight, frivolous? I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I, well, I'll tell you what my opinion of that is. And it, it links to the football match that we're talking about. Because, you know, we're talking about music, but really we're talking about a football match and seeing how the music of the time is a prism to understanding what was going on in the country and on the football pitch at the time. Okay, the punk thing came out of the first burst of anger, if you like, at the recession that we were in. Uh, the, yeah, the, the model was in. starting to crack, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people and the youngsters were rebelling. And with a little bit of technology, they realized, well, hang on a second, I can make my voice heard uh, at very little cost. And then the infrastructure gets in place to sort of distribute music through fanzines and that kind of thing and to play gigs you know, in pubs, literally the punks just took over the sort of pub scene, which had been dominated by sort of middle-aged rockers or at least rockers harking back or attracting middle-aged um, drinkers at the time. And um, for by 1983, remember, we've had four years at that point of Mrs. Thatcher telling, being, beating us down. I'm not making a political point about this, but certainly beating down the resistance one way or another four years of it and out at four years you know you can't win you couldn't win against the Thatcher. i'll give her that you know she was going like you turn if you want to this lady wasn't for turning uh, whether she had a handbag or a steel handbag whatever the russians iron lady is what the russians called her of course um called her and after four years of that music scene the rebelliousness in the music scene starts fading out it's imploded to a certain extent as well to be honest in in fighting and uh whether some of it went more kind of left wing towards trying to like fight the national front the fascist of the day and the music scene that's emerging slightly different generation is also now sort of like coming to terms with the fact that hang on you know Remember, a lot of people did well at Thatcher as well. So suddenly, all yeah, you're but, all these. But they did, but not so well then. And it's still bad times. I mean, I the, 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 the boom kind of, it's around eight, the mid 80, 86, 87 that you I started to feel that. the boom. No? The, the first thing that Mrs. Thatcher did when she came to government. You could buy your council house. Right, that, exactly. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah, people love that. Right. And so you suddenly turned people who were working class into middle class people with a pride in their home true, that they true. never had before. And look at, you mentioned that all of these new romantics are coming from the suburbs. Where do you think they were buying council houses? They were buying in the suburbs as much as in the inner city. And they're coming out of middle class homes. The generation before that, all the generation thought, well, Wham was in a city in any case, but no, the, no, Wham is well, just down the road from me. It's, it's uh, Southgate, wasn't it? Southgate? No, no, it's there, Watford. But, Oh, it was Watford. So, oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Just, just on the road from from where, where I grew up, and and George Michael could have gone to private school. And that's an immigrant thing, you know. That's his yeah. Dad and, but you yeah. see, I was thinking because I grew up in Little Cyprus, which was Harringay in those days. And yeah, I think he, I think he, that, that's where he was born. Yeah, but and he, then they he moved, moved out. Moved. Again, because it's an immigrant thing. You it know, is because the, you know all. All the, all the Cypriots, all the Greek and Turkish Cypriots that lived in Harringay, in the stretch of Harringay between Manor House and Turnpike Lane, a mile of stretch of uh, uh, Green Lanes, <clears throat> they all moved a little bit north to Southgate yeah. and Palmer's Green. That's why I'm thinking, oh, he's slightly younger than my generation. He must come from Palmer's <laughs> Green to Southgate. Yeah. That was so stereotypical, <laughs> and I have to apologise to that. I have to apologise <laughs> for that completely. But, no offence, no offence. Yeah, no, no, but you, you get, you're getting, no but with, um, with the New Romantics, 
they're all Bowie boys, aren't they? They're all from that generation. And yeah. there's hardly and, any blacks there. I was coming on to that because yeah, that true. reflects what's going on in the pitch as well. But yeah, go on. True. And uh, um, Wan, uh, Elton John, that's one of their big influences. You know, so it's, it's a generation that haven't been influenced by the Pistols and the Clash and the Specials. It's a generation whose influences are, are coming from other places. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. I don't know where they're... I, I, I always feel that New Romantics was somewhat constructed and dreamed up in a publicist's um, you know, living room uh, uh, around a coffee table with three or four other bands uh, or three or four other musicians that they couldn't quite pitch. And they thought, oh, well, why don't you dress up as like faux, you know... Um, romantics in terms of the the lakers in poetry the shelleys and all of those the byrons and everything like that and then just we write some sort of like lyrics that's all like ethereal or um, ephemerate or whatever it might be and uh, yeah put, put a good melody to it and then just pose on stage as if you know you're you, you look at this photograph of lord byron and <laughs> do that on stage where Lord Byron's <laughs> looking off into that is how it happened mate yeah. I'm sure that's how it happened Brilliant. if it's not how it happened then I'll eat my hat that's how it should have happened in any case okay let's get back to this football match I mean yeah, so you're making one you're making player. a link with a lack of black faces on the field well I'm not only making a link with that I'm also making a link with come out of the war with Argentina the Falklands war uh we're in a place where people have now bought their own council houses it's not that we're content but it's almost kind of like the the old order has restored a, a semblance of um the status quo uh -huh. the status quo in this match is that manchester united are going to duff uh -huh. brighten up very you good. see where i very went good. yes yeah. yeah they're going to duff that's the status quo so even though the so we're all quo, gordon smith we yeah. are Gordon Smith, the yeah, Brighton I'm striker who has the yeah. chance. And we blew that chance and the old hierarchies imposed themselves. Exactly. But it took them a, a, a rematch to impose themselves. Yes. The point yes. is that that, that um, rebelliousness that you talk of is still there. It's underlying all of this. It's still there. Just well, because it, you've it got... It blows over. And the next year is, is the minor strike, which is the big mm. test. Isn't it? it's, the, yeah. it's the decisive moment when yeah. trade union power is broken. Uh, and uh, and what well, people are living now with the amount of rent that they pay or the amount of mm. mortgage that they pay mm. and the lack of protection they have at work, they're living with the consequences of 84. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We, you know there were all the riots in '85. It was, uh, it was, it, it was a, it was a intense time, but we're living with the consequences of it now. Uh, and uh, when when I talk to kids, if you try and talk them, and the minor strike was huge, and it mm. radicalized a, a lot of people that I know, radicalized me more. And um, but people, uh, when I when I speak to like kids of me mates it's a world that they can't conceive mm -hmm. that they can't imagine um, a, like trade unions or something like that it, 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 it just seems abstract to them do you know i i was at university at this time when i came back from Sweden, i went back to university at eight, 83 84 and um here in the uk that is in england and we you know i went to a pretty radical university militant and I was obliged, like so many others, to have, because, you know, miners came on our campus to, you know, to, to rally support and everything. And, of course, they're all from up north, you know, far up north. So they had nowhere else to kip and they didn't have any money. So I was obliged, like so many others, to take in a miner in your tiny, tiny, tiny little um, room in, in halls. And... Um, <sighs> He was a good bloke. He was a good bloke, but it was a different world. And when he let one rip, when he let one rip, I had suddenly realised <laughs> that I could pretend as if I understand what the miners are about. But ah, oh, flipping heck, mate! I still got the 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 um, aroma of it still wafts somewhere in the back of my mind. But remember, we're talking about new romantics in terms of the music. Well, this final, this first match. This final between Man United, which could never 
you know, a replay could never happen again because FA Cup gets done and dusted on the day for TV rights and everything else. But in those days, you could go to a replay and a little bit more of a gate and money. Th- there were none for years and years and years. And then it was like yeah. waiting for a bus because you had three in a row because yeah, the two exactly. previous years had gone, gone, for, gone to exactly. replays and this, this exactly. one as well. Exactly. Yeah, I'm glad you remember what the buses are like over this side. Yeah. wonder if they're the same in Brazil. Uh, so th- this is David Lacey writing in The Guardian. And these are exact words. The 1983 FA Cup final pits logic against romance. Yeah. Do you remember the, the logic of your arguments about the music mm-hmm. in the day? against the romance of the time uh, pitched logic against romance and for a major sporting occasion this is surely the ideal plot he's right he's right he's referencing what's going on in the real world as well the logic of hang on we just fought a war against a couple of sort of conscripts and we're bigging ourselves up what on earth is that about against the romance of oh at least we've got our own council houses or whatever it might be it's exactly what this match is about today Manchester United who's progressed to Wembley for the second time this season and the sixth in eight years has gone strictly according to form face Brighton and Hove Albion who may be forgiven for pitching themselves up to the moment when they are summoned from their dressing room for the pre-match presentations and are hit by the roar of the crowd. You see, I don't think it's the roar of the crowd that gets them. I think when they're lining up in that tunnel to go out onto the pitch and they're looking at the Man United lot and they're looking at themselves, the Man United lot, who aren't as fit and gallant and statuesque as they are today. I remember seeing this when... Man United played uh, Millwall in, was it an FA Cup final? It was the FA Cup final, wasn't it? At Wembley. And then you saw Man United lot come out of the coach into sort of the underground garage of Wembley. And they all look like stallions compared to the mayors of uh, uh, Millwall who had descended like half an hour earlier. I mean, they looked, the Millwall lot did look fit when they came off the bus, but when you saw the Man United lot, they just didn't look. And although both sides here aren't as physically fit, uh, they're not, you know, Adonis's, they're not Cristiano Ronaldo's. However, there is a difference, you know, you look at the thighs of those Man United matches, and I'm sure those Brighton lot, when they were standing in line waiting to be brought onto the pitch, looked at those thighs and thought, we're going to get hit. And it's going to (laughs) hurt. It's going to hurt, mate. Uh, But they didn't show any fear. And and, and one of them did get hit very early on, uh, right in the midriff uh, from a ball by, who would it have been now? Oh, I can't remember which Man United player. It could even have been Ray Wilkins. But I've got a feeling it was um, Gordon. What's his name that was playing for Man United at the time? Uh, Strachan wasn't wasn't, wasn't there. uh, No, no, it wasn't Gordon Strachan, was it? There was another Gordon. White side. Yeah, it could have been Whiteside, could have been Whiteside. Let's say it's Whiteside for the sake of argument. And anyway, he got hit in the midriff and the camera sort of panned to where the ball was going. But I'd like to have seen that guy go, oh, that hurt. Because Man United kicked the ball a lot harder than Brighton in this game. And I think that's what kept them in it. No, uh, no black, black players. Would have had one, Remy one. Moses. There was one black player for Brighton. Oh, right. Brighton right one? back, right back. Brighton, Chris, Ra- Chris Ramsey, yeah, yeah because who, who lost his place for the replay. Maybe, well, that, maybe that, that's where it went all wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, I remember John Watson, you know, introducing all the players, and he said, "Yes, and there's Chris Ramsey of West Indian background." Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> he had uh, to actually say, "And like yeah. West Indian, give me a flipping break." But did he I say was, here's Gary Bailey of South African background? Because he was a Man United goalkeeper. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Remy Moses was suspended. So he, he, uh, uh, sorry, Remy Moses was injured, as he so often was. Terry, a little midfielder for for Man United. So he he didn't play. But one foreign player, Arnold Muren, the uh, the, the cultured Dutchman with a wonderful left foot. Indeed. And only two foreign players. It's an entirely different game, isn't it? So different from today. two, Two foreign players, including the Man United goalie, of course, then. Yeah, all, although on Gary Bailey was like, he actually played for England. Oh, uh, well, but then he was, he was, only one foreigner. English well. dad and yeah. 
but I think born in South Africa, maybe, but certainly he spoke with a, with a very strong South African accent. Was the, was the game as intense as we'd expect it to be it, well, from, from today's perspective? The, the pitch cut up very, very badly. Uh, the players weren't nearly as fit as, as they are now. And there was, there was that thing of, a, of the tension of the occasion. Mm. Now, people used to talk about Wembley sapping turf. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't any particularly more sapping the grass, you know, than any other grass. It was just that the build-up, it, 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 players in, in FA Cup finals, they used to drop out with cramp all over the place. Mm-hmm. And that, that wasn't the properties of the grass, you know, that was, that was, the, that was nervous tension. That was the whole build-up of weeks and weeks and then the whole, you know, the day that they probably haven't slept the, the, the night before and, uh, and they've been up since six o'clock and, and that nervous tension, that, that, that takes it out on you. Yeah, it does. Although you can't argue that the Wembley pitch is a bigger pitch than you would have been used to if you were a seagull. Um, that, that, that pitch is there to enable the England team. It's not there to enable some team from the lower divisions to come out and think that they can be Man United. Whereas Man United have been more used to it. The second time that season, they're on that pitch. They know what it's like. You've just, I've done a while I've thought about this, but I've just realised how much I miss Brighton. <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I, it's I nice like going place. to the station. You get to the yeah, station, yeah. and and then the walk down. Yeah, the walk yeah. down. Uh, I worked on the pier for one summer a few a few years afterwards. What in Brighton? Uh, yeah, in Brighton. Yeah, flipping I, was, egg, um, mate. I worked selling seat selling t shirts on Brighton Pier. Yeah. in the summer of the summer of eighty seven. I got a lot of affection for the, for the place. I just saw it in my mind's eye. Now I just saw getting out of the railway station and and, and walking down walking down towards the beach. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't have kept my mind on the uh, job if uh, I know me in any case. I probably wouldn't have kept my mind on the job, which is just as well that I didn't get a job. On the, they saw me coming, obviously, and thought, no, no, not him. Not today, sunshine, as they used to say in those days. OK, so it's going to go to a replay. I think the advantage will always be on the bigger team in a replay. Sure. Sure. It's like, it's like a mini league then, isn't it? And then, you know, the shorter the, the, the duration of time, the more chance there is of an upset. Mm. So the longer the duration of time, the more chance that the favourite is going to count, kind of, uh, is come that, out on top. Is that, that happened because, in 81, it happened in 82, it happened in 83. Is that because of strength in depth or is it because the, the top flight players are just, just more better. fit? Not better. Uh, it, it's think, better think, rather than better. fit. Uh, yeah, rather than I, I fit. Think, uh, I think so. I think so. Because the, the second game, I don't think it was decided on fitness. And Brighton actually started quite well the second game. And then bang, 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 before half time, it's all over. It's all, it's all taken away from them. Before tiredness has set in, it's the, the, ex, the extra quality of United. And the longer time that they've got to show the extra quality, the more chance that they, they, that they have of, of doing it. It's why Leicester winning the Premier League is so utterly, utterly unbelievable impossible until they did it because you know you, you a Leicester might well win an FA Cup or something a shorter but you know for Leicester to be Premier League champions at the age, at the end of 38 games it mm. can't possibly happen until it did yeah Ron Atkinson was born in Liverpool by the way he was oh, born right. in Liverpool. yeah you didn't realize that did you no, so I'm, I'm no. schooling you I have to school you every now and then you get to school me more Where did time he grow up no, nowhere near Liverpool, no. <laughs> because mm-hmm. you can hear it in his voice, nowhere near Liverpool. But he was born in Liverpool, and that's the connection there. Um, and I wonder if the manager in the replay has to take some credit. When Man United, like you say, over in the first half, so they must have found Brighton out. Because Brighton would face Man United in the replay, and they set up pretty similar as I recall, to the way they'd set up. In yeah, the with, with, with Steve Foster. So they right. thought defensively that they were tighter. They were but tighter. I mean, the, the, the two in the middle, Wilkins and Robson, well, they were, they were a terrific combination. Wilkins was full of wonderful passing, imaginative Robson, passing. Mate. And a Robson just league. had that thrust. Different and, you know, the, Yeah, and the two of the three goals that they scored before half-time are, uh, are, are Brian Robson. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're listening to the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, and you can get us on Twitter and Facebook, and you can watch the whole episode in the 1129 Media uh, channel on YouTube. Now, a little bit of wrapping up to do. First of all, the thing that I wanted to bring up was just to give you a sense of uh, where Britain was at this time. I want to point you to a headline. <laughs> Unbelievable, because, you know, we're talking about 
37 years ago. The headline is London Gay Plague Alert. If you can believe this. So we'd forgotten, hadn't we, that when AIDS reared its ugly head, people were talking of it as a gay plague. And this is mm. from the Guardian's, oh, sorry, the Observer's, uh, so the day after the, the cup final, the, the day after, in the Observer, their science correspondent says, London could become the centre of a British epidemic of the mystery disease AIDS, which has so far killed more than 200 people, mostly homosexuals in America. Now, I don't blame the science correspondent, but I blame the editor for allowing that headline uh, to be passed. It's the kind of headline that you couldn't dream of or, you know, you couldn't dare pose today. And I wonder whether when you ask about, you know, what the country was like at the time, that those kind of, that kind of rhetoric plays very, very importantly in the rhetoric. We were a very uh, divisive, or the nation was divided by politics, perhaps, but we were very kind of divisive. It was a very divisive time. I think. And yeah, well, are we, are we, it was very, very divisive. But, and, and I despise a lot of the things that happened then. But one thing over the course of time, I will, I will give the, the, uh, the Tories some fair play for, is that I think in the end, they dealt with the AIDS plague thing reasonably well. Mm. They, they, they toned down the moralism. And it was it was it was a process of education in safe sex, uh, and I think things could have been a lot worse. Do you, do you think that was? Well, I'm asking you a political question. How, how could you possibly know? I was just thinking your opinion because, as much as you say that, I wonder if it's like the current COVID crisis that we're in, and I think the government is trying to save people's lives, but nevertheless. It's as much to do with the impact of these things on wider society that it's not necessarily from a moral point of view, if that makes sense. It's sometimes it's not because you have suddenly um, seen the light, as um, Hank Williams might put it, and, but more to do with, hang on, it's better if we do it this way. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm too far away from from England to, that they seem to have wobbled all all over the place. No, no I wasn't um, thinking yeah necessarily about COVID, but in terms of um, the AIDS, the change in narrative of AIDS at that time. But it, it was surprising because I, I remember being at college, you know, between eighty four and eighty seven, which is the time when people, you know, we're all going to die of it. We're all going to die of it, and it, it was a it was a a level headed and pretty much non moralistic approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, and may, if, if this happened today, I'm not, I, I think there would be more angry moralism going on. Why do you think, moving back to the music, through which um, we open a window to the FA Cup final, why do you think The Beat, one of the original two-tone groups, decided to cover an Andy yeah. Williams tune? Why, why not? And it's like a brilliant Andy Williams tune. He ain't done nothing wrong. Andy Williams has not put a foot wrong and they've gone and done it and you will never hear their version over Andy Williams played on any radio station ever. For me, that, that's uh, an example of that kind of movement that we were talking about that starts in like 76 and gets new momentum in 79. It's an, an indicator of how that's run out of steam mm. because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the beat did some fantastic stuff and poor old ranking Roger who we lost not yeah. long ago. It's another multiracial band from the Midlands. Uh, but he doesn't get a word in, doesn't get a word no, in anyways. There's no, no it's, it, it's, it's a travesty, isn't it? And it, it, it's around the same time that UB40, who've done some great stuff as well, they're, they start to become a karaoke band. Well, yeah, so yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's the moment when, totally. when that generation starts to run out of steam. 100%. And the next generation, as we're talking about, is, 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 a, is a more frivolous one. Well, and the Fun Boy 3 is a much more frivolous band from the specials that they started out in, and Our yeah. Lips Are Sealed. No room for Neville Staples, their, their rapper in that one. You know, mm -hmm. they relegate him to playing congas. 
basically. And there is a decent tune, one more decent tune in the charts, number nine, F.R. David, whatever happened to him, and who was he? <laughs> Words, because you know, it's, it's got good melody. It's got good melody. I passed over on uh, number no, eight, uh, Tears for Fears, Pearl Show. Oh, you're not having the F.R. David no, one, the words? No, no really? No, I, I remember um, John Peel presenting it on Top of the Pops, and I think it was the week he called <laughs> everyone the multi-talent. And he went, when he went down a run of the charts, so yeah. number number eleven, the multi-talented, and he did it with most irony. Where it was the multi-talented F. R. David. <laughs> on that, that note, I think you've made your point, and we've made our point on this edition of uh, the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Like I say, do make sure that you uh, find us on Twitter, on uh, YouTube, where you can watch the whole thing. And you can see him in his uh, great, well, pair of sunglasses. Let's just put it like that. Red pair of sunglasses. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and on YouTube, on the 1129 Media YouTube channel. Legendino, thanks very much. Thank you.